all of us want to be like Jesus. And I am, I'll be 65 next month, and I accepted Jesus when I was eight years old. So that's 57 years ago. That's three to four times the lifespan of some of you. And I've got to tell you on two, two sides. One, the challenge to walk with Jesus, in my life at least, gets greater the older I get. But secondly, I've been immensely blessed by having several people in my life that really lived out Jesus. So if I, if I ever have people that say, you know, you really can't live a holy life. You really can't live like Jesus. Well, I'm not, but I have been close to people who do, and I knew them intimately, so I know it's possible. So I'd like to, it always helps to, to know somebody who really knows Jesus and, and really is close to him and walks and lives like him. So I think it's good. We don't, we don't follow anybody but Jesus, but I think it's good for us to have models that we say, yeah, yeah, I can see that working out in that person's life. And that's what I'd like to visit with you for a few minutes today about C.S. Lewis. So before we start, let's, let's pray. Father, I'm so grateful that your grace has reached us and that in our brokenness, in our sin, you loved us anyway, but you loved us too much to leave us like that. Your love is transforming, remaking us day by day, moment by moment. So would you please help each one of us where we are in our walk with you, that we would learn something from this servant of yours, C.S. Lewis, that we can apply in our own lives. And we'll be very grateful if you could do that for us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, <clears throat> Walter Hooper was this American guy from the South, a deep Southern accent. And he met C.S. Lewis just a few months before he died and became kind of like his secretary, but also became a very good friend and later wrote what I think is one of the best biographies of him. And Hooper later said, Lewis was the most thoroughly converted man I had ever met. Don't you love that? Wouldn't you like it if somebody said that about you? This is the most thoroughly converted person I've ever met. Another guy, Eric Routley, heard him, heard Lewis give his weight of glory sermon at the church, and he recalled years later, when I met Lewis, I knew here was a man who had been laid hold of by Christ and who enjoyed it. That's the kind of lives we want to live. For a long time, <clears throat> I've admired C.S. Lewis. I think I got my first copy of Mere Christianity back in 1969. That's ancient history for you. But I knew him as a great apologist. I knew him as a great author. Read all the Chronicles of Narnia to my kids two and three times as they were, when they were young. And then my wife and I have read through it two or three times and read all these other books. And I admired him as a scholar as this amazing professor at Oxford and later at Cambridge. And... But I didn't realize how thoroughly converted he was, how really godly he was. And so and, uh, a few years ago, my wife and I were both speaking at an Oxbridge conference. It's a C.S. Lewis conference, at, first at Oxford and then at Cambridge. And the opportunity to meet people who knew Lewis to go to his home, be in his study, wander around his house, and walk around his yard. I realized here's a man that had all the warts and foibles of the rest of us human beings, but he was truly a godly man. And it struck me how little I'd understood of his, the deep level of his discipleship and his obedience. And so I'd like to just share with you a little of what I've been seeing in his life over the last few years as I've studied it, of how he lived like Jesus. And let's just put it in the model of uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Now, you need to understand, first of all, that Lewis was not naturally a very nice person. Actually, uh, 
he was, one person said he was thoroughly obnoxious. He was arrogant and a condescending intellectual prig. And actually, he was kind of weird. He had some sadomasochistic habits, and he was a really messed up guy. And in fact, he had this strange relationship, but nobody knows really quite what happened because of a promise he made to a college buddy. Uh, if one of us is killed, you'll take care of my parents. And his buddy was killed, so he took in his buddy's mom. And it's never quite sure, because Lewis didn't even talk about it to his brother, Warren. But they had kind of a weird, quirky relationship. The extent, I don't know. But most biographies kind of sidestep the issue, other than Alistair McGrath. But let's just say Lewis was a sinner, and he acted like one. Like, here's an example. The first time, he was a young professor at Oxford, and he met this senior professor, J.R.R. R. Tolkien, and his, here's Tolkien, who's already a well-established scholar, and Lewis's response was, he is a smooth, pale, fluent little chap. No harm in him, only needs a smack or two. Now, that's a rather condescending response to a guy who's a great scholar. I won't go into the story of how he became a theist in around 1929 and then came to know Christ in about September of 1931. But later he said, what we practice, not save at rare intervals, what we preach is usually our great contribution to the conversion of others. So let's take a look at some of the fruit of the Spirit in Lewis's life and see how he lived it out. Let's, let's talk about first about love, and I want to see three ways that we can see Lewis's love for God. One was his devotion to prayer. He was really a man who was devoted to prayer, and I loved uh, John Piper's message this morning reminding us of the visibility of prayer in our lives. He was constantly conversing with God. Now, Lewis never learned to drive, and so he had a driver. The driver's name was Clifford Morris. And Morris said, and Morris saw him, up close and personal, day after day, year after year. And Morris said, Lewis was one of the most prayerful men I've ever known. And uh, sometimes when Lewis, Morris would be driving him from Cambridge over to, uh, from Oxford over to Cambridge for his week of teaching, he would say, Morris, I'm sorry I can't talk for a quarter of an hour. I need to do my prayers. So he, he was very intentional about it. Morris talks about one time he drove up to the house there at the kilns, and Lewis was just pacing back and forth in the driveway, uh, very intently looking down. Finally, he looks up, apologizes for keeping him waiting, and says, oh, I was just saying my prayers. And he often did this at the Oxford train station, too. He would pace up and down saying his prayers. Lewis loved God through his praying. But there's another evidence of his love for God, and that is his faithful attendance at worship services. And it's interesting, even before he came to know Jesus, he just became a theist, and he became a regular attender at church services, including the morning services at the college, 8 o'clock every morning. Now, you've got to understand he didn't have a natural propensity to enjoy church services. In fact, he really disliked the public, as he called it, public aspect of church going, and particularly disliked organ music, which he considered one long rower. And friends would talk about, they would watch him in the worship services during the congregational singing, and he would have this grimace. He was obviously at pain. He was very pained to hear the congregational singing along with the organ music. But he was faithful every morning of the week and on Sundays. I took these pictures at his little local church uh, there near the kilns near Cambridge, near Oxford. He began reading, even before he became a Christian, just a believer in God, he began reading St. John's Gospel in Greek. And he continued this practice of reading the New Testament in the original language every day for the rest of his life. And in fact, 
within about 15 years after his conversion, he had virtually whole portions of the King James Version memorized. So, he, uh, he had all of the Psalms memorized by heart. So you could name any Psalm and he could recite it. So he showed his love for God by faithful attendance. Now, much of my work, uh, we've been living the last five years in Lithuania because my wife and I were teaching in the university. And most of my life, it's, it's been as an academic or working with academics. And I got to tell you, us academics sometimes have a difficult time finding, finding a home at church. Now, my wife tells me I'm ADD, attention deficit syndrome. I, I, I think I probably am. I get very bored very fast. And so in church, my mind is bouncing off the walls, thinking of ideas and all this. And a lot of academics confess they have a difficult time finding a church where they are comfortable. But Lewis has always been a good reminder to me. It's not about me being comfortable. It's not about me having fun or feeling good, even about the experience. It's about joining my brothers and sisters in worship of our holy God. He loved God by his faithfulness to worship. The, the next way that he showed his love for God was through his commitment to evangelism. Now, somehow the words Oxford professor and evangelism should not even go in the same sentence, should they? But Lewis was committed to what he called hot gospeling. And it's universally recognized that it, it, he sacrificed a huge amount in his career uh, because he was so hot gospeling. In fact, he would often quote famous British writer Rudyard Kipling. You've probably heard of him. But Rudyard Kipling was, being, was talking with General Booth, and Kipling was kind of poking at Booth about his evangelism, and Booth said, young man, if I could win one soul for God by playing the tambourine with my toes, I'd do it. And that was one of C.S. Lewis's favorite quotes, and it was his way of saying, at any cost, I'm going to tell people about Jesus, even when I'm in an atmosphere where it cost me a great deal which it did. He was giving a talk to Anglican priests and youth workers in a little article that's now called Christian Apologetics, and he said, our chief task at present is to convert and instruct infidels. Another talk he gave to theology students, he said, woe to you if you do not evangelize. Another essay, he said, the glory of God, and as our only means to glorifying Him, the salvation of souls is the real business of life. Commitment to evangelism. And you can hardly imagine, Robert knows the atmosphere at Oxford very well, but you can hardly imagine any atmosphere more antithetical to evangelism than Oxford. And yet Lewis was faithful. He loved Jesus so much, he was a hot gospeler. Don't you like that term? Hot gospeler. Well, the next fruit of the Spirit we see in his life is patience. Now, i got to tell you, as an academic, and maybe to you, whatever, whatever you are, the idea of spending my life in a place like Oxford, doing a few lectures, tutoring students, that seems kind of like a dream life, kind of like the idyllic life that would just would be perfect. Well, Lewis's life was anything but perfect. There's an old verse in the King James Bible that says, tribulation works patience. In other words, bad stuff makes you more patient. And Lewis had a lot of bad stuff in his life. So let's talk about the patience. He had a lot of troubles at Maudlin College in Oxford. And it links to his evangelism. After he became a follower of Jesus, he was ostracized by many of his colleagues because he had committed the unpardonable. He became a follower, a serious, not just an Anglican, he was a follower of Jesus. Now, he taught at Maudlin College in Oxford from 1925 until 1954. Now, do the math, that's 29 years. That's a stinking long time to be in one place teaching. 
And in spite of the fact that he was recognized as one of the top scholars in his field globally, he was never offered a chair at Oxford until after he had accepted a chair at Cambridge. And then, oh, oh, here, here, here you go. In 1947, his friend Tolkien was trying to marshal support for Lewis to get a chair, kind of like head of the department at the Chair of English. And he, Tolkien later said, I was taken aback by the extraordinary animosity of the others in his faculty. His colleagues disdained his forays into writing about theology and writing children's literature. That was the unforgivable. Now, so he was rejected several times for promotions. And Alistair McGrath, that wrote one of the more recent biographies of Lewis, said Lewis had, was, had no doubt that he was regarded by many of his academic colleagues with suspicion or derision. He seemed to be a prophet without honor in his own city and university. Years later, after Lewis had been dead a long time, an old man who had been a fellow, a colleague of Lewis at Magdalen College, declared that Lewis was the most evil man I've ever known. And when he was interviewed, now, now, what's the basis of you saying he was the most evil man you have ever known? He said, well, he believed in God, and he used his cleverness to corrupt the young. And that made him the most evil man who had ever lived. So Lewis experienced rejection after rejection and ongoing open animosity. Now, you've got to understand that it wasn't like he would go in to teach a class and go, go away and never see his colleagues. You, you know the British college system where the fellows are eating dinner together every night. So you're eating with the people who are hating you and are regularly voting you down from any promotion. So it's not like you can hide in your little cubbyhole somewhere and you never see your colleagues like at some American universities. You're with your colleagues every weekday for at least one meal and sometimes two. That was a tribulation. That was a tribulation. But that wasn't the end of his tribulations. He had troubles at home. One of his main sources of trouble was this Mrs. Moore, the lady who he'd had this weird relationship at first. And then, now I, I need to tell you that after his conversion, there was never any indication of anything untoward by Lewis. He was absolutely, once he was transformed by Christ, he was, he was clean. But whatever love or comradeship or intimacy they had shared, had dissolved long ago, and she became a cantankerous, domineering woman who remained in Lewis's home until she died in 1951, along with her daughter, Maureen. And Mrs. Moore ran the house, literally ran the house, and treated Lewis like an, actually she called him, an extra maid. Here's this great scholar who's the extra maid. On one occasion when Mrs. Moore was confined to bed, she was sick a lot, Lewis wrote this, I am so domestically tied to the bedside of an elderly invalid that I can never be sure of being able to leave Oxford. On another occasion he wrote to a friend who had reproached him for not replying promptly. I mean, what would he have done with emails where if you don't respond in one hour, you get in trouble. And he wrote, Dogs, stools, and human vomit have made my day today. One of those days when you feel at 11 a.m. that it really must be 3 p.m. And in a few weeks, Lewis actually collapsed and had to be hospitalized. Uh, stress. Just a few hours after Mrs. Moore died, Jack's brother, Warren, who was his closest friend, finally opened up and wrote this in his journal just hours after she died. In the last 15 years of her reign, not an accidental use there, I don't think I ever saw Jay or Jack, uh, C.S. Lewis 
chose the name Jack when he was about four years old, just out of the blue one day. I mean, what would you do if you had a name like Clive Staples? You know, really, do you want to go to grade school with a name like Staples? So he chose the name Jack, and actually my oldest grandson was named Jack after C.S. Lewis. But he said, I don't think I ever saw Jack work, work more than half an hour. Now think about this. More than half an hour without the cry of, Bob Boys! That was her nickname for Jack. And where Bob Boys comes from, I have no idea. Coming, dear, and down would go the pen, and he would be away perhaps five minutes, perhaps half an hour, possibly to do nothing more important than stand behind, beside the kitchen range as scullery maid, then another spell of work, then the same thing all over again, and these were the conditions under which all his books were produced. So next time you're reading a C.S. Lewis book, you got to think about these tribulations. One time he was invited to Lambeth Palace, the head of the Anglican Church, where Archbishop of Canterbury, for an important meeting and had to write and reply, I never know when I can, even for a day, get away from my duties as a nurse and a domestic servant. And then in parenthesis he said, there are psychological as well as material difficulties in my house. He wrote a letter uh, to another person. He said, strictly between ourselves, this is after she died, I have lived most of my life in a house which was hardly ever at peace for 24 hours amid senseless wranglings, lyings, backbiting, follies, and tears. I never, listen to this, I never went home without a feeling of terror as to what appalling situation might have developed in my absence. So much for the idyllic life of being an Oxford professor. Tribulations. But he was learning patience. In fact, he wrote to one of his pen pals, Don Giovanni, who was an Italian priest, and since Giovanni didn't speak English, they wrote all the letters back and forth in Latin. And Giovanni was urging him to do more writing. And Lewis responds, I labor under many difficulties. My house is unquiet. Don't you love that phrase? It's unquiet and devastated by women's quarrels. My aged mother, he referred to Mrs. Moore as his mother, worn out by long infirmity is my daily care. Pray for me, Father, that I ever bear in mind that profoundly true maxim, if you wish to bring others to peace, keep thyself in peace. He had tribulations. Unfortunately, he was to face even more stress with his own dear brother because his brother was, uh, he was an alcoholic. He struggled lifelong with alcoholism and finally had to be put into a nursing home. But Warren wrote in his own journal, he said, after all of my struggle with insomnia, drugs, depression, spirits, illness, Jack's kindness remains unabated. And ironically, this, it was just after this that Lewis began pouring forth this veritable flood of writings that are still captivating millions of readers around the world. Now, <clears throat> late in his life, he married, he married uh, late in life, in fact, uh, 1956, and he married this American divorcee, Joy David, ben, David Ben Gresham, and uh, again, the details are a little murky. Apparently, he married her so she could be treated for cancer by the national health care system in Britain without having to go back to America where she had no insurance. And Joy had two sons, so they became Lewis's stepsons. And one of the sons, Douglas Gresham, who, who played a pretty big role in the filming of these recent Chronicles of Narnia movies, later wrote, Jack found himself not only a student, but also a domestic servant, a handyman, carpet layer, occasional carpenter, removalist. Every time they moved from one resident to another, it was Jack who did the hard work, assistant cook, and so forth. 
Amazingly, he was able to put his practical skills into a wide variety of tasks while still keeping up with his academic pursuits. And all this, all this, without complaint or resentment. How you doing so far? Are you, are you coming up to this standard of bearing up under tribulation in your own life? Do, I'm not very good at bearing up under stuff without some complaint, some resentment. Do you see why Lewis is a good example for us to say, okay, that's how it looks to follow Jesus under less than ideal circumstances. Another characteristic, the fruit of a spirit is kindness. One of the most common testimonials that you'll read about Lewis's life was that he was a kind man. Now, he demonstrated this in many ways, but especially in his deep concern for serving others. He did this, first of all, by simply paying attention to others. And in fact, one friend said, Lewis demonstrated by action what transpires when one human being treats another with attention. Now, probably most of you have been to university, and probably most of you have had professors who would not be, let's just say, not be known for their kindness, or certainly not known for their attention to each individual. Many of us in the academy are known as being not only introverted, but kind of disconnected. And I've been charged by that by my own wife. She says, you've got a little bit of Asperger's, I think. And it's not uncommon in the academic world. So it makes it all the more amazing that Lewis connected in a very real way with individuals. Now remember, he was not naturally kind. In his young years, he had a cruel streak. He was not a kind person. But probably in one of the most famous sermons he ever gave at St. Mary's, St. Mary of the Virgin Church in Oxford, ironically the same church where John Wesley delivered many of his most famous sermons. In his sermon, The Weight of Glory, he said, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. And Lewis actually treated people. He actually treated people like they were important. In fact, one of his former students said many of his pupils became teachers of one sort or another, and all, or most of them, became friends. And especially in the British system, that's even more unusual for a professor to become friends with their students. Now, you got to understand that lecture, Lewis's lecture style, on the outside, would, you would not think it would lend itself well to developing friendships with your students. Because he would come, he was a tall guy, about 5 feet 11 inches tall, thick set, ruddy face, always rumpled clothes, and wrinkled and but he had a big voice, a big Irish voice. And when he came to the end of his lectures, he would gather up his books and his notes. He would uh, tuck in his horn rimmed spectacles into his pocket, pick up his mortar board, put it on, and he'd, 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 lean, he'd lean over to return the watch that he had borrowed from some student on the front row and he would, continuing lecture, he would continue lecturing as he walked out the door, and he would finish the final sentence of his lecture as he walked out the door. But it was also the way he started, because he started his lectures, not like I was sitting here today when you came in and just kind of relaxing a little bit. No, you would have already been all in here, but right on schedule, he would come bustling in the room, and the first words of his lecture would be uttered as he came through that door. And then he would be pouring forth all that time. So 
One of these students said he always forged a personal link with those who heard him. Now that's incredible. That lecture style, that place, the hierarchical structure of the British college system, and he formed a link. And one of his students said this, I think this was his great secret. He hated casual contacts. Human contacts must for him be serious and concentrated and attentive, or else it was better avoided. It might be for a moment only, but that was its invariable quality. If ever there was a man who exploded the slander, that academic means remote, dull, and inhuman, that man was Lewis. Kind of a different style of academic, don't you think? And he also had this ability to to recognize and applaud the good things that had happened in people's lives. Um, there was a friend of his that he had known for years, Maureen Blake, and uh, she came to see him in the hospital after his heart attack. And Maureen herself had gone through a major event of her life. After decades as a music teacher, she had unexpectedly inherited the title and estate of a distant relative by the amazing name of Sir George Cospatrick Duff Sutherland Dunbar, or more simply, Baron Dunbar of Hembriggs. So she was all of a sudden, after being a music teacher for decades, now she was Lady Dunbar. She arrives at the hospital after his heart attack, and she was told that Lewis had not recognized any of his visitors that day, kind of floating in and out of the coma, unconscious kind of state. So she entered his room very quietly, clasped his hands, and quietly said, Jack, it's Maureen. No, he replied, unsurprisingly giving his condition. He added, it's Lady Dunbar of Hempregs, and Maureen was stunned. She said, oh, Jack, how could you remember that? On the contrary, he murmured, how could I forget a fairy tale? So here he is in this kind of hanging between life and death, but her name triggered this amazing gift that had come into her life. He was quick to respond to the needs of others. One day he was studying away, writing at his home, the kilns that you saw there a few minutes ago, and somebody in the house mentioned that there was a man who'd gotten sick. He was kind of out in the country, and there was a, a worker that was sick in a, in a field nearby. And as he, as he was writing, he just muttered, ah, oh, poor devil, and, and kept writing. And then he suddenly jumped up in distress and said, I have sinned. I have shown myself to be lacking in all charity. And out he went. He went to find the man in the field, brought him back in, heard his story, gave him some treatment, probably gave him a drink or two, and saw him off, probably gave him some money to go with it. He took care for people who were in need. Lewis consistently served others, even in academic settings, which, again, are very hierarchical and status conscious. When Lewis began teaching at Cambridge, at Magdalen College there, he was technically the junior fellow because he was new. And it was the job of a junior fellow to fill the glasses in the evening of his colleagues. And one of his colleagues there said, we tried to absolve our illustrious new professor from performing this menial task, but characteristically, he would not allow us. And the Inklings, these little group of close friends, Tolkien and others, who would gather at the pub once or twice a week and read their stories and their writings to each other, Jack was the one who consistently got up to fill everybody else's mugs. A friend said, Lewis was always an encourager he affirmed his many correspondents' dignity and promised to pray for many of them on a daily basis. Phrases like, I will certainly put you in my prayers. 
or you are all in my prayers were frequently mentioned. I, I would say literally hundreds and hundreds of times in his letters. So again, makes you think of John Piper's message to us this morning, reminding us of the importance of prayer in our communication. Now, one thing that made him famous across the ocean was a Time magazine article in 1947. Now, his voice was already one of the most famous voices besides Winston Churchill all over England because of his broadcasts on BBC. But this picture, this magazine, this article brought him immediate fame. And so he began receiving bags and bags of letters every day. And he made a commitment to personally respond to every one of these thousands and thousands of letters. And he told Arthur, his best friend, it, was a, it is a duty to answer fully letters from serious inquirers. In the 1950s, there was this one woman in America. I mean, you know how, how persistent, crazy Americans can be. This one woman, one, one woman alone wrote 138 letters to him. I mean, give the guy a break. You know, you got one letter, you got two, let it go. And he admitted to a friend that she was a very silly, tiresome, and probably disagreeable woman. But he explained that he felt he should continue writing to her because he also knew she was old, poor, sick, lonely, and miserable. Now, that's a sense of compassion for somebody he'd never met, would never see, but he took care. That's kindness. One of the ways his kindness was exhibited was by praying for others. He wrote to one friend, I am often, I believe, praying for others when I should be doing things for them. It's so much easier to pray for a bore than to go and see him. So next time you're in a situation and you're having your devotional time, as important as your devotional time is, if you have a really close friend or if you're married, if your wife or husband needs your help, i got to tell you this phrase, I'm often praying for others when I should be doing things for them. It's hard for me to keep praying when I know my wife is working on something that I really should be helping her on. That's kindness. And he's also a generous man. Now, he was Irish, so he, he kind of lived with this fear of going bankrupt all his life. But he was so generous, he gave away so much of the money he was making from royalties because he committed that everything he had made from his Christian writings, he would give away, that he didn't understand. He, he wasn't the best on accounting, and he didn't understand that even if he gave his money away, he still had to pay taxes on it. And so there were several years he had to borrow money to pay his taxes because he'd given away all his money. So, a generous man. In fact, there was, there was a time when he was giving two-thirds of all his royalties just to help poor people. So he was, a, he was a man of compassion. Another friend said, he paid you the compliment of attending to your words. One final characteristic. The fruit of a spirit, gentleness or meekness. Now, Lewis was keenly aware of the dangers of pride and conceit, and he was very transparent in admitting this, this difficulty that, like Piper reminded us, we all love ourselves. God knew that. That's the problem. And Lewis was keenly aware. He admits in one section on communion, somebody was asking his advice on communion. He said, I'm not good enough at theology. I have nothing to offer. Hiding any light I think I've got under a bushel is not my besetting sin. I am much more prone to prattle unseasonably. And there were many times in his writing, he, somebody would ask his advice and say, ah, I'm sorry, I, I have nothing to offer. So here's this guy. We would we'd say, the guy's brilliant. He's not a theologian, but he sure does theology well. But he says, mm, I have nothing to offer. And one guy asked his opinion about sanctification. And he said, nah, I'm not qualified to give you the guidance you need. These things I need to learn, not teach. And after, just after he became a believer in God, before he really 
had a personal relationship with Jesus, he went through what we would call conviction, deep conviction for sin at a level that many people never experience. And so he writes to his best friend, Arthur, and he says this, I have found out ludicrous and terrible things about my own character. Sitting by, watching the rising thoughts to break their necks as they pop up, one learns to know the sort of thoughts that do come. And will you believe it? One, of, one out of every three is a thought of self-admiration. When everything fails, having had its neck broken, up comes the thought, oh, what an admirable fellow I am to have broken their necks. I catch myself posturing before a mirror, so to speak, all day long. I pretend I am carefully thinking out what to say to the next pupil, for his good, of course. And then suddenly I realize I am really thinking how frightfully clever I'm going to be and how he will admire me. And then when you force yourself to stop it, you admire yourself for doing that. It's like fighting the hydra. There seems to be no end of it. Depth after depth of self-love and self-admiration. You know that feeling, don't you? You do un spontaneously under the guidance of a spirit. You do something to serve somebody or some act of humility. And immediately Satan comes and brings up this thought. Oh, now you, that, you, you're impressed. You better hope people see this. That's impressive. Thoughts of pride that ruin the very moment of obedience and service. So Lewis was a gentle, meek person. And in fact, even though he was very well known, even in the 40s, he, he gave a whole series of talks to Royal Air Force uh, folks as they were at, at war. And it's so interesting because he was known as this scintillating speaker. But in his own journal, he writes, I've given some talks to the RAF at Abingdon already, and as far as I can judge, they were a complete failure. One must take comfort in remembering that God used an ass to convert the prophet. So you've got this amazing, gifted scholar and speaker, but he's realistic enough to realize uh, that didn't come out very well. I, I didn't do that well. But even among his friends, here he's a world-famous author, and one colleague said the one author he was usually silent about was himself. No man was less given to name dropping and no one was ever less of a snob. Ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical gossip, indeed gossip about people at all, was completely foreign to him. More often than not, he would make a point of sitting next to the most junior person in the room. He was interested in ideas and things, though, when pressed. His judgment of character was sharp and penetrating. He was too shy to appear to want to be known and too modest to think they wanted to know him. One of his friends, Leo Baker, he had a, they had a rift in their relationship. And it, it remained a, a ruptured relationship for a number of years. And eventually, Lewis wrote to him, and apologized, saying that he hoped to pick up some of the old links. And in his letter, he just straightforwardly says, will you forgive me? Now that, that is meekness. A willingness, as Piper mentioned this morning, to, to humble yourself. Will you forgive me? Hooper, this American that became his secretary in the last months of his life, says that, he asked Lewis one day what he thought about his growing fame. And Lewis answered, one cannot be too careful not to think of it. And he seemed to honestly think that his fame was just a passing fad. His driver one time told him, he said, uh, Jack, I think it's, it's too bad that you don't preach more often. 
And he, he, Lewis responded, well, one day after I've delivered a sermon and I received the kind words and congratulations and all and sundry, as always happens, I begin to think, what a jolly and fine and clever fellow Jack Lewis is. So I had to get to my knees pretty quickly to kill the deadly sin of pride. That's a man who is following Jesus in gentleness. In fact, Owen Barfield, who was a longtime friend, said, I never recall a single remark, a single word or silence, a single look, the slightest flicker of an eyelid or alteration in the pitch of his voice, which would go to suggest that he felt his opinion entitled to more respect than that of old friends he was talking with just because he was a famous author. I would say that's reflecting Jesus in a real situation. So what do you, what do you think? It's, it's a challenge, isn't it, to walk with Jesus and to be transformed by him. But here we're seeing someone who, who really tried to practice and who was transformed by Christ. So I think it makes a good chance to kind of sit back and evaluate our own walk with God. And I jotted down some questions as I was thinking about, now this is a long list, but it's, it would be good to have quiet time to reflect on these kinds of questions. Do I treat others with respect and courtesy? Do I listen to others, even, even those without graduate degrees, if you're an academic or if you're in some profession, without your professional credentials, and those from whom you have nothing to gain? Do I look for opportunities to serve? Am I generous in meeting the needs of others and of God's kingdom? Have I totally irrevocably signed over control of my life to Christ? Am I spending time every day in God's Word? Even when Lewis was on vacation, his friends knew he would be in the Word of God every day. He was soaking in the Word of God. Am I daily mentally engaging in prayer, conversing with God? He was serious about praying. Am I willing to evangelize even at the risk of being ostracized by my friends and colleagues? Am I sensitive? Am I kind? looking out for the needs of others. Is my life marked by a gentle humility that prefers others over myself? How do I handle being mistreated or treated like a servant? We all like to be known as servants, but we don't like to be treated like servants. Am I faithful in attending public worship? In short, am I thoroughly converted as was C.S. Lewis. You see, the breadth of his influence and the depth of his insight came from the intimacy of his walk with God. So my prayer is that, that we here at ELF, that we would be transformed, by, that, that we would be truly transformed by Christ, thoroughly converted by the renewing of our minds, conformed to the character of our Lord Jesus Christ.